Welcome to Tisky Sour. We have five massive, very, very significant stories for you tonight. A potential peace deal between Ukraine and Russia. Some glimmers of hope, although, of course, we shouldn't get too carried away. Boris Johnson lands in Saudi Arabia. Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe is released from Iran. Um, and we are also going to talk about Biden's deadly sanction, sanctions on Afghanistan and the 120,000 people or more than 120,000 people who have offered to take in Ukrainian refugees, something that completely flips the narrative on its head that British people are unwelcoming to people arriving here from war zones. Potentially, we could have, you know, potentially government policies could have led to this kind of attitude for, for different wars, if only. I'll be discussing these themes throughout the show with Dahlia. Gabriel, how are you doing, Dahlia? I'm good. How are you, Michael? I am okay. We have two expert guests lined up for you today as well. It's going to be a very, very informative show. We do want to know your comments and your questions. You can tweet them on the hashtag Tisky Sour or put them in the comments box. We are only three weeks into Putin's war on Ukraine and updates from the ground are already beginning to look grimly familiar. As you can see from this map, Russia still only controls one city in Ukraine, Kherson. Its march on Kyiv remains slow. And in response, Putin continues to increase the brutality of his invasion. Unable to occupy cities, he instead destroys them. This aerial footage shows the result of Russian shelling of the besieged city of Mariupol, home to 430,000 people. The Ukrainian government estimates 2,500 civilians have been killed in the city, which has been subject to fighting since the first day of the war. Mariupol's mayor says the figure could be as high as 20,000. But while this war of attrition continues, there have been glimmers of hope as to a potential breakthrough in peace negotiations between Ukraine and their occupier. Addressing foreign leaders, on Tuesday, President Zelensky suggested Ukraine were ready to compromise on NATO membership. Я радий, що наш народ починає це розуміти і розраховувати на себе і на наших партнерів, які нам допомагають. Zelensky would later say that negotiations with Russia were beginning to sound more realistic. Then today, the Financial Times revealed what they called a 15-point plan drawn up by Russia and Ukraine to end the war. They wrote... The proposed deal, which Ukrainian and Russian negotiators discussed in full for the first time on Monday, would involve Kyiv renouncing its ambitions to join NATO and promising not to host foreign military bases or weaponry in exchange for protection from allies such as the US, UK and Turkey. The FT say their reporting was informed by free people involved in the talks and it follows positive public statements from Russian representatives. Putin's press secretary Dmitry Peskov told reporters today that neutrality for Ukraine based on the status of Austria or Sweden was a possibility. Both countries have their own armies but are not part of military alliances. For his part, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov has said that, quote, absolutely specific wordings were close to being agreed in the negotiations. However, an advisor to President Zelensky tempered expectations this afternoon. Mikhail Podolyak said, briefly, FT published a draft which represents the requesting position of the Russian side. Nothing more. The Ukrainian side has its own position. The only thing we confirm at this stage is a ceasefire, withdrawal of Russian troops and security guarantees from a number of countries. So, how close could Russia and Ukraine be to a peace deal? And if so, what might it look like? I'm joined now by Taras Vadirko, an anthropologist at St. Andrews University who specialises in the war economy, media and oligarchy in Ukraine. And um, thank you so much for joining us today. And can I start by getting your your perspective, your sense on, on the noises we've been hearing over the past two days when it comes to, you know, prospects for a, for a peace deal? Uh, thanks, Michael. I, as, as many people, I'm, of course, hopeful that Ukraine and Russia are nearing um, a positive result, namely, you know, specific proposals and, and agreements, because the war, as has been going on, it's only getting uh, bloody and bloodier. Um, I think what we are hearing in terms of the 
denials from Mikhail Podolak, but also from Zelensky himself, denials of the positions that Russians have openly supported and potentially fed to the FT. Those are attempts to slightly distance themselves from an appearance of being led by um, by the Russians in, um, in, the, in these negotiations. So I think uh, this is a signal that uh, any compromise on Ukraine's part might be difficult to sell uh, to certain parts of the elite uh, and, elites and uh, certain parts of the population for, the, for Zelensky and his uh, entourage. You know, Ukrainian society has talked a bit about you know this this blob. The Ukrainians they they speak with one voice. That voice is Zelensky, and they are you know I, I mean I agree with this. They're honourably resisting the Russian invasion, but clearly you know all societies are complex. Zelensky isn't going to have a completely free hand in these negotiations. What are the different red lines that different parts of Ukrainian society have when it comes to any peace with Russia, and and what pressures, what specific pressures will Zelensky be under? Uh, frankly, right now, it's quite difficult to say because of the way in which the situation might have changed uh, over the past three weeks. And it's been very, very difficult to judge what exactly is going on uh, around Zelensky and in the Ukrainian government and in between the Ukrainian government, the parliament, the oligarchs and various kinds of, uh, let's put it, pressure groups, armed groups um, and, you know, more generally the electorate simply because the war has redrawn the map of political forces since it began. But if uh, the build-up to the war is uh, anything to go by, I think it's fair to say that there is a substantively influential contingent in the Ukrainian society, namely the civil society organizations oriented towards, uh, let's put it that way, the Euro-Atlantic order, right? Uh, the Western-funded uh, CSOs, parts of the military, volunteer battalions, um, but, uh, you know, certain groups in the parliament who have been consistently opposed to what they see as appeasing Russia, i.e. entering any kinds of compromises with Russia, who believe uh, right now that they are on path to winning this war or at least um, pushing back on most of uh, the Kremlin's demands and who I think will have most to, the most to gain politically from trying to undermine uh, the kinds of compromises that Zelensky might have to go go for and to accept if a peace negotiation is has been negotiated. At the same time, I think it's fair to say that there are many, many people in Ukraine who would gladly accept um, the uh, a compromise that would include a ceasefire and a withdrawal of Russian troops, potentially also reparations, simply because their livelihoods have been so profoundly disrupted. And I'm talking mainly about ordinary civilians, many of, many of whom have fled abroad and possibly would like to return. So, um, yeah. I mean, if you, you've said Many people in Ukrainian society would accept a, a ceasefire, if, you know, if it involved reparations. Of course, you know, Russia were going to demand a cost for that, right? So that would be, you know, presumably de facto recognition of Crimea as part of Russia, um, neutrality, which we, which is what we sort of started this show talking about, and then also the question of what will happen in Donetsk and, and, and Luhansk. What what compromises do you think Zelensky might ultimately be willing to make? What compromises do you think the Ukrainian population could could swallow here? You know, just yesterday or today said that uh, um, what the Russians are saying, namely that uh, a, a Sweden-like or Austria-like neutrality could be an option for Ukraine, that's been denied by the Ukrainian side. Um, so I'm not exactly sure what, what compromises the government is willing to accept there, even though it's clear that uh, these options have been on the table uh, since day one uh, of the negotiations, or, 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 or maybe at least since the second or third round of negotiations before they became much more technical in the last week. Um, so clearly they, they have been talking about um, the options of neutrality, potentially recognizing Crimea, um, recognition of the separatist uh, republics, uh, people's republics of Donetsk and Luhansk. The question is who and what proportion of the Ukrainian electorate is willing to accept that? Um, I, uh, you know, I've been doing research with the militant right and uh, with the nationalists, and I think it's uh, these kinds of compromises, namely acceptance of the inroads that the Russians and the separatists have made into Ukraine since 2014, is extremely unpopular among these highly mobilized uh, groups. At the same time, I think you see that you saw at least on the 23rd, 22nd of February, just before the invasion, that the Ukrainian intelligentsia and these very nationalists, they sigh, you know, they sigh with relief when uh, Russia recognized uh, the separatist republics as sort of in the independent statelets because it's as if they could just let it go. So I think even though the rhetoric publicly now in the media from the government is that we, uh, the Ukraine isn't willing 
officially to accept these kinds of compromises, potentially there actually might be um, slightly more willingness to accept that, um, even among the people who are publicly sticking uh, to their guns and kind of being quite militant about uh, pushing back Russia and not accepting anything. It, it does seem like this issue of Donetsk and Luhansk. I mean, again, this is kind of taking it, you know, we're sort of assuming here that Putin is willing to come to some kind of agreement. It might be the case that, you know, this was always a facade and all he actually wants to do is is fight an endless war in, in Ukraine. I, I don't think we can sort of rule out that possibility. But Donetsk and Luhansk, so those those regions of, of, of eastern Ukraine, which have been, or at least parts of them, have been under separatist control since 2014. Do we have an idea what people living in those regions want at this point? So, you know, obviously there are, there are some mobilized people in those societies who are demanding that they be recognized as independent states. Do we, do we know if that's a a popular opinion among the populations of those zones? I'm sorry, I'm going to keep going back to this. It's very, very difficult to say at the moment exactly because um, of uh, the way in which the war might have upset uh, established opinions. I mean, there was very, very little social research coming out uh, for understandable reasons from, from the two republics. Um, from what I'm aware of, uh, there's the opinion about what should happen in terms of the reintegration the opinion that was there before the beginning of the war, but what should happen uh, about the reintegration of the Donetsk and Luhansk people's republics into, the, into the, ter the territory of Ukraine wasn't that different on either side of the of the contact line. And uh, there, a significant proportion of the population wanted these areas to be reintegrated peacefully um, into Ukraine, potentially along the, um, the lines of the Minsk peace agreements, but that's gone, simply because I don't think that uh, it's realistic to think that uh, Russia all the separatist republics could walk back on the, the recognition of their sovereignty by Russia and could simply accept any kind of reintegration uh, into Ukraine. I mean, this, that was a major line of negotiations between Ukraine, Russia and the separatists over the eight years preceding the current invasion. And I think that was supported um, both in the, uh, in the two separatist republics and by a significant proportion of the Ukrainian population who uh, voted for Zelensky on his peace and reintegration platform. Um, but... At the current moment, I haven't seen any discussions in in the public in the public domain in the in the media that would um, actually be about what to do with the two with the two separatist republics. Simply because the current issues on the agenda are, uh, let's say, much more immediate, which is you know the, the withdrawal of Russian troops, uh, cessation of hostilities, and so on. I think um, I don't think the negotiations that are currently ongoing are in any way about the reintegration of the two of the two republics. I mean, more likely they're about the recognition of their of their sovereignty, whatever the people on the ground might be thinking. That was Taras Fadirko, and thanks to him for joining us this evening. Let's go straight on to our next story. Four days after Saudi Arabia executed 81 of its citizens, Boris Johnson has travelled to the kingdom to beg it to pump out more oil. The timing of the trip relates to Russia's war in Ukraine, which has caused the price of oil to rocket. Johnson wants the Saudis to increase production to try and bring down those prices. But human rights concerns won't magically go away. As Johnson landed in Riyadh, Foreign Secretary Liz Truss was grilled by Sally Nugent on the BBC. 81 people were executed in Saudi Arabia just a few days ago. Is that a regime we should even be negotiating with? As I say, I don't condone the policies of Saudi Arabia, but we have to be clear that we are facing a serious threat, not just to European security, but to global security in Vladimir Putin and his appalling behaviour. And if we don't make sure that Vladimir Putin loses in Ukraine, the likelihood is that he will want to go further. We have to stop him at all costs. We have to work with all partners around the world. We won't necessarily agree uh, with all those partners on everything, but it is so important that we stop Vladimir Putin. He is the real threat the world faces. We have to stop Putin at all costs, so we have to work with people even if we really disagree with them. That's an incredibly dishonest argument. Why? Because Britain isn't a reluctant trading partner of Saudi Arabia. This isn't simply us deciding we should now trade with the lesser of two evils because challenging Putin is more urgent. No, we have been a key trading partner of Saudi Arabia for decades, including since 2014, selling the kingdom £20 billion worth of lethal weapons. 
Since 2014, those arms have been used to target hospitals, schools and food stocks in Yemen. They are exactly the type of war crimes Britain is now rightly condemning Putin for committing. This is not a reluctant relationship we have with Saudi Arabia. We are you know, up to our wrists in blood when it comes to this relationship. Dahlia, I want to bring you in on this. What was your take on Liz Truss's answer there? And what are your thoughts about Boris Johnson landing landing in Saudi Arabia to ask MBS to pump out more, more, more oil, Mohammed bin Salman? Well, I think it's instances like this that really expose a contradiction in how the British state presents itself versus what the British state actually exists to do. Uh, and this is sort of true of all um, Western states to an extent, which is that on the one hand, the West, you know, and we've seen this play out a lot over the past few weeks, whereby the West sort of defines itself as the pinnacle of civilization, uh, democracy, against a barbaric and inhumane East. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's democratic, it's caring, it's got the moral upper hand, um, it believes in the inalienable human rights of the individual. And yet the wealth of the British state and the ability of the British state to function uh, relies on and has always relied on the violent extraction of resources like oil um, and labor from abroad, which often involves having a very uh, authoritarian and disciplinary local state. You know, we often wonder why uh, historically the British and the US government have supported the implementation of dictators abroad. This is in, inexorably linked to the fact that dictators and authoritarians often can discipline their populations to provide the labor and resources that are necessary for the global elite. Um, and so even though this violence is not necessarily directly done by the British state, it involves the deep complicity and connection between the British state and the who got uh, this violence. And this is why we are constantly finding ourselves mired in what feels like a contradiction, just like with, you know, Liz Truss, with, with the examples of sanctions, et cetera, uh, against certain regimes for human rights abuses, whilst the direct you have the direct uh, collaboration with other states that are definitely as, if not more, complicit in human rights violations. Um, and whereby you have our nation's identity, which is defining itself by human rights, et cetera, but we seem to constantly be in bed with promoting and allying with nation states abroad that violate those values. And it's because the state is wired to operate on that kind of, of outsourced violence, even if we don't get our hands dirty in that way, although I would argue that we, we do. Um, and so that's why, as you outlined, this idea that Britain is this kind of, this, this relationship with Saudi Arabia is uh, a novel relationship. It's, it's sparked simply by an emergency situation that we're in, that Britain is a reluctant ally of Saudi Arabia. That is a historically not true. Also, the, the violence of the Saudi state is not merely a disagreement that you can just overlook. But state violence in especially in parts of the world that are very rich in resources um state violence is necessary in order to pro produce and extract resources at the scale that the global the global capitalism uh demands and so we have to think about these relationships between different countries as sort of systemic uh, and the 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 deep embeddedness the deep reliance of the british state on the wealth of the Gulf, um, which have notoriously um, abusive and undemocratic uh, governments, that you can read much more about that in David Waring's uh, Anglo Arabia, which is a book that really goes into the kind of historic the history of that political um, formation. But you know, it's totally disingenuous for Liz Truss to be acting um, brand new here, uh, and the, the Saudi people know that. Liz Truss know that. We know it. Um, but unless that fundamental material connection between 
you know, and, and so long as we have a global economy that relies on violent resource extraction, on violent disciplining of large swathes of the global population, um, particularly in the global south, where, you know, that relies on a heavily authoritarian government disciplining populations to produce the labor and commodities and resources that are necessary for the global elite to be able to be enriched in the way that they are. That contradiction between what the British state says it's for and says it exists in, in order to defend and what it actually defends and what it actually allies itself with globally, that contradiction is going to con- continue to exist. It's not just that we are you know, indirectly implicated. As you say, Dahlia, is we are literally supplying the Saudis with the bombs they use to bomb civilian infrastructure in Yemen. And we, should, we showed a clip on, on Monday's show of a woman saying, the only thing Yemeni children know of the United States and the United Kingdom is as labels on the bombs that fall on their homes, right? So, so this is the impact we're having in that part of the world. And you know, as we discussed on a previous show, normally um, when a politician is asked about it, I think this was this was Michael Gove on Sunday. He's asked, "Well, isn't it a bit inconsistent? You know, you're selling them arms." Except, well, this is a security ally, you know. So this this bizarre moral relativism where if someone commits war crimes who isn't a security ally of the United Kingdom, this is suddenly you know rightly an outrage. But if someone is a security ally and they commit human rights abuses or war crimes, as Saudi Arabia is doing, oh, well, you know, everything's relative, isn't it? Maybe they maybe they committed some war crimes, but they are a security ally. We can't afford to lose an ally in the Middle East who's spending billions of pounds on our weapons and supplying us with oil. This is This is not about human rights, or at least as soon as economic interests come into it, human rights goes out the window. Human rights, if it is something that the government ever cares about, is something which can be trumped by material interests, which, I mean, it, it clearly is being, that, that's clearly what's happening in this case. Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe has been released from her six-year-long detention in Iran. This photo shows her on a flight out of the country. Zaghari Ratcliffe had been held since 2016 when she was arrested on charges of plotting to overthrow Iran's government, an allegation which she denied. Zaghari Ratcliffe has been released alongside another British Iranian, Nusha Ashouri, who was arrested in 2017 for spying, a charge again she also denies. Zaghari Ratcliffe had been the most high profile of the two prisoners. That's largely thanks to the tireless campaigning of her husband, who has been desperate to reunite his wife with their seven-year-old child. This was the emotional moment when a BBC newsreader announced the development. Two British detained, two detained British Iranians, Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe and Anusha Ashouri, heading to a... Sorry, this is a moving moment because these are people who have been detained for some time. So we're hearing that Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe and Anusha Ashouri are heading to uh, the airport in Tehran to leave the country, their lawyer Hojat Kamani has said. So why has Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe been released now? Well, her husband Richard Ratcliffe has long maintained she was being held as a bargaining chip from Iran to pressure Britain into paying a debt it owed to the country. In September 2020, he explained the situation to Kay Burley. If I'm honest, I think Nazanin was picked up in the first place to get that money. Uh, there was a. Um, this is money that we owe because. This is, this is money that the, the UK owes um, Iran going back to an arms deal that was done in the 1970s that then fell apart after the revolution. Big long battle about how much compensation needed to be paid back and so on. In the end, it went to court and there was a court award which was then held up payment uh, due to sanctions. Um, over time, that's become an increasingly bad-tempered uh, um, relationship and, and at the end of the point where, yeah, we were taken hostage um, and have been held ever since. That debt to Iran, which Britain had refused to pay, amounted to £400 million. That's according to an international court. The British government have now belatedly confirmed that debt has been paid, hence Nazanin's release. But this leads to a second question. Why did this payment happen now? Why didn't Britain settle its debts six years ago? Well, there's speculation that the resolution of this particular dispute could be related to the renewed attempt by Joe Biden to renegotiate the Iran nuclear deal. The deal was signed by Barack Obama in 2015, but was killed by his successor, Donald Trump. Ever since then, Iran has been subject to crippling sanctions which have pushed millions of Iranians into poverty and provided a barrier to the UK repaying that £400 million that they owed to Iran. 
So potentially, the payment that enabled this release was made possible because of progress in ongoing negotiations to lift sanctions on Iran. But now we have a third question. Why are the Americans suddenly in such a rush to renegotiate the Iran nuclear deal? Joe Biden has been president for over a year, yet progress with Iran had until recently been slow. And this is where it gets really interesting. Last week, CNN reported that in response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the Biden administration has been attempting to reopen relations with oil-producing nations like Venezuela and Iran, which have up to now been cut off from the US. With Russian oil subject to sanctions, Biden wants oil from Iran and Venezuela back on the market. And all of a sudden, Western sanctions, which have long crippled entire economies, can be lifted. Don't get me wrong, I'll be glad if sanctions on Venezuela and Iran are lifted. They have achieved nothing except pushing millions of people into extreme poverty. But is this the way policy should be made? We'll trash your economy until we need your oil. It's, it's geopolitical games like these that meant Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe spent six years, six years away from her young daughter. And she is far, far from the only victim. Dahlia, I want, I want your thoughts on, on the release of Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe and you know, how you think this might fit into broader geopolitical development. I mean, it's absolutely wonderful uh, to have Nazanin uh, on her way home now. Uh, it's, it's been a grueling six years for her and her family. Her daughter in particular has been robbed of precious formative years um, with her mother uh, Richard Ratcliffe is also a really wonderful person. I've had the pleasure of meeting him. Um, and he has really set the bar for husbands because I'm now looking at my man like, if I was in detention, how tirelessly would you campaign um, for my release? But I think that this, you know, firstly, this story really sheds a light as, as we explored um, earlier on in the show about how sanctions in particular are deployed politically. Um, especially when we think about, rather than, you know, humanitarianly, which is what we're often told, uh, especially when we think about the story where sort of Saudi Arabia and why we don't see similar policies leveled against Saudi Arabia, is, which is an, an, an economic ally um, of, of the UK and of the US. Um, and it's a problem, you know, this story shows us why it's a problem that sanctions are framed as this kind of non-violent solution to conflict. Now, obviously, you know, it's not the same as dropping bombs on a city. The, the violence is much less immediate. But that doesn't mean that there isn't a real human cost, that this isn't some kind of act of war on the people, uh, because it tends to hit everyday people the most, which includes those like Nazanin and also Anusha Ashuri, who has also been released today. Um, but also affecting people within, in a more general uh, sense, the populations of, of countries that sanctions hit. For example, you know, people with disabilities are in particularly uh, deeply affected because sanctions don't just hit food. Uh, they also hit materials and ingredients that are used in medication. Uh, this is a chronic issue. And for people who don't have relatives in unsanctioned countries who can send medication back, that tends to be the working class people who have disabilities or chronic and terminal illnesses. These are the people that are hardest hit um, by, by sanctions. So we can't speak of sanctions as a, a nonviolent uh, act. And that's why when sanctions are implemented, we as a public have to scrutinize, uh, scrutinize those sanctions, who they're hitting, why they're being implemented, who will suffer? They need to be scrutinized with the same keen eye as we might scrutinize more obvious acts of war uh, or more explicit acts of, of violence. And we've also, you know, we've spoken a lot over the past few weeks about how seemingly neutral or like descriptive categories like refugee seem to be, seem to take on very different meanings depending on who is occupying that category at any uh, one time, you know, we've talked about it in terms of the differential treatment by the media of Ukrainian refugees versus refugees from the Middle East uh, and Africa. And I think that the same goes here. But 
when it comes to the category of citizen, you know, we think of citizen as like a description, right? Like if you have certain papers, then you're a citizen. But what we're seeing here, you know, I don't think that it's, I don't think that it's the fact that Anush Ashari, Ashuri and Nazanin uh, Ratcliffe have been languishing in an Iranian jail for six years when clearly the, the, there was a way out of that. There was a route out of that. Um, that, and that politicians like Boris Johnson were wantonly reckless about her case, but then still went on to become prime minister. I don't think there's a disconnection between that abandonment and the fact that these are two people who are dual Iranian British citizens, who are brown dual citizen citizens. We already can see that there is a differential treatment um, between how black and brown people, particularly those who, who have either dual citizenship, but also now because of the Nationality and Borders Bill, people who uh, are eligible to apply for a second citizenship um, are at increased risk of having their human rights um, attacked, particularly by being made stateless. So that tells us that there's a differential responsibility here that the British state sees itself as having for protecting people who have any non-British heritage um, in their in their background, and um, particularly in their immediate background. And so I think that, you know, this is a day for celebration, but it tells us a lot about both the political use of sanctions and the fact that there is a real human cost to sanctions and it's often the least, the most vulnerable who are impacted by it, but also that there is a crisis of citizenship happening right now and that all citizens are not made equal when it comes to what the British state, the allowances and the, the resources that the British state is, is willing to put in order to back um, the human rights of, of certain people in this country. It is too early to say whether Western sanctions on Russia will be a success. But one place they are already failing is Afghanistan. The country has been placed under severe sanctions since last year when America's withdrawal led to the Taliban quickly returning to power. As punishment for that humiliation, America's war is continuing by economic means. So what were the sanctions imposed by the United States on one of the world's poorest nations? Well, just like in Russia, the US confiscated the assets of the Afghan Central Bank. Seven billion dollars worth of reserves were frozen, leaving Afghanistan unable to pay for imports of food or medicine. Their financial system also collapsed. As a result, by December last year, the UN warned that 22 million Afghans, that's more than half the population, faced severe food insecurity. This is part of an ITV report from January this year. To the people here, all these children, it doesn't matter that the Americans have gone and that the Taliban have come back. What does matter is that they just don't have enough to eat and that it feels like they are being forced slowly but inevitably towards starvation. They work miracles at the children's hospital. They need to for babies like Hazibullah, whose survival seems against all odds. Amina fights for breath, her malnourished body unable to fight off infection. Her mother tells us she will stay at her bedside until God decides her daughter's fate. For week after week, staff worked without pay. They still lacked medicine and equipment, and sometimes even miracles won't do. We have in the previous months, mortality was about 200. 200 children. 200 children was died in here. But underlying it always is yes, hunger. It's just hunger. hunger. To discuss the effect of American sanctions on Afghan society, I spoke earlier to Obaidullah Bahir, a lecturer at the American University of Afghanistan and a visiting scholar at the New School in New York. I began by asking Obaidullah what he understood to be the purpose of American sanctions on Afghanistan. I think there are multiple ways to look at it. Some would say that it was just the United States using the last means available to it to push the Taliban towards a certain sort of behavior. Um, another way of looking at it was just there was just frustration and anger because, uh, I mean, the withdrawal 
and the way it happened from Afghanistan brought back memories of Vietnam for the United States. So uh, some would say that it was malice and it was vindictive in nature as well. But I guess just look at it this way. Um, Russia invades Ukraine. A sovereign state is invaded by a supposed superpower. And the United States stops short of disabling swift bank transfers to Russia. That was one of the first things the United States did to Afghanistan, right? So, I mean, there has to be some measure of uh, evil and, and how much suffering is being caused and sanctions have to be proportionate to that. And what was done to Afghanistan, the moment the Taliban came to power, uh, sanctions were imposed. And that too, in a, I mean, it makes sense in a democratic state where you're trying to push the larger population to stand up to the ruling elite and get them to either change behavior or push for regime change. But in a state where the Taliban had just won a 20-year conflict uh, and come to power through a total victory, what do you expect the Afghan people to do considering the huge asymmetry of capabilities? And you mentioned suffering there. Can you talk about the, I suppose, especially the humanitarian consequences of the sanctions which have been imposed on Afghanistan? I mean, there was a video a few days ago um, of a young girl sitting on the street side. I mean, the amount of beggars on the streets of Kabul and the major cities have multiplied exponentially. This little girl, she is crying uncontrollably. And when asked why she's crying, because the person is trying to give her bread to eat, she says, my feet are cold. I can't feel my feet. Um, and we tried to track down the girl. She had been missing after that for a few days. Um, there are kids as young as seven and eight uh, who go out, do manual labor, only to be able to earn a dollar a day to feed eight members of their family. There are people who had half decent jobs who are selling their wives jewelry now just to afford bread to eat. People buy stale bread at night from the bakeries so that they could uh, at least save a few pennies. Um, and that's, that's the cause of uh, the sanctions. And we don't want to see it. We don't want to think about it. But this humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan is man-made. It's, it's Yemen all over again, where the world pushes a population to starve. We have gotten past the point where a part of the world is starving and dying because there isn't enough food to eat. There is food to eat in Afghanistan. People just can't afford to eat it, you know. And what has been the political effect of them? Has it in any way weakened the Taliban? Has it shored up support for them? How has that played out? I personally think that sanctions or generally leverages work well when there is something to be exchanged, when there is constant engagement, where there is a communication of expectations. So um, it's just like you're dealing with a kid and you tell them this, these are actions you're not supposed to do. These are the consequences of it if you do them, right? But oftentimes we just get so bogged down in grandstanding politics and appealing to our own local um, support base that we don't care about the, the nitty gritties of what would come out of the lack of communication. So basically, um, Biden botched the withdrawal. Uh, to make up for it, he ended up imposing sanctions to not appear weak. Yeah, he did that. And after that, his whole policy has been, if we ignore it long enough, maybe it will go away. Uh, and that's not how world politics works. And the Taliban aren't going away anytime soon um, unless there is some sort of engagement, unless there is some large scale mobilization in Afghanistan. That's not going to happen anytime soon. I keep saying that a hungry Afghan is not going to care for his rights, right? His urgent uh, priority is to survive the day. And unless we can elevate that and, and get Afghan people to have some sort of basic needs met, Afghanistan will find its solutions organically, but they cannot come about when half the population is worried about its next meal. Can we talk about the, the Taliban and Afghan politics more generally? It's been uh, about six months, I think, or at least that since we last spoke. At, at that point, 
in time, it was unclear how the Taliban would govern. They'd just come back into power. What have we learned since then? How different are they from 20 years ago? You know, have they, you know, fulfilled our worst nightmares or, or been a little bit more moderate than they were as, as we had hoped at the time? Actually, it's interesting because a lot of people have uh, varying views of what has come about. And um, one has to acknowledge that a lot of the Afghans that left Afghanistan in the initial days of the fall ended up seeing the worst version uh, of what Afghanistan could be, and, and they kept that with them. Uh, the reality has been that the United States negotiated with a group of the Taliban um, with regards to certain guarantees of living up to international norms, uh, but they weren't the group that came to power. Uh, after an initial month-long negotiation, we had the original conservative leadership of the group come to power. There have been positives. Um, one of the positives, though the Taliban like to take credit for it, is the active fighting being over, though uh, they were the ones fighting. So the fact that they stopped fighting doesn't really give, give them much credit. But the general peace uh, in Afghanistan has made the rural areas far more accessible than they ever were. Obviously, the sanctions are making things difficult. The Taliban uh, have shown defied certain expectations of how bad they could have been. But there were certain things that happened, including a temporary ban on women's and girls' education. Uh, the universities have opened up again for, for women, which has been great. Uh, we are hoping that in a week, uh, as promised, girls would go back to high schools as well. So if that happens, one of the major problems would be resolved. There is also the issue of women's place in society. Um, the Taliban, in rhetoric, say that they would be allowed to work but we are yet to see a lot of tangible policies that reinforce that. Uh, one of the things that has been problematic is the Taliban's way of dealing with dissent. Uh, recently, we've been seeing civil activists and uh, commentators disappearing uh, for weeks and then showing up saying, oh, the Taliban were very nice to us and um, not showing up on media again. And that's very classic. Uh, authoritarian, totalitarian behavior. Um, I mean, look, the reality is the Taliban took over in a way where the rules of the game were out of the window. And now we have to reestablish them. And the international community can play a role to complement the efforts of Afghans internally to sit across the Taliban and define some sort of norms of how we will interact with each other. What are the do's and don'ts of um, the government. And in the longer run, hopefully we can create space for pluralism and a discussion on constitution and laws and rights. Um, but uh, yeah, the ideal outcomes aren't going to be ideal. It is an unfortunate reality. We can make something out of it. In the longer run, I think Afghanistan has the capacity, if left to its own accord, to find its organic solution towards a sustainable future, hopefully. That was Obaid Bahir speaking to me earlier today. It's long been a common refrain of the right that when someone speaks out in support of refugees, they should be asked, well, would you have one live in your house? The question was always stupid. You can support refugees without having a spare room, just like you can be against homelessness without putting someone up in your living room. But putting that to one side, the fact that 120,000 people in Britain have now offered to house Ukrainian refugees means this argument, which was always silly, has now become untenable. In response, the right have shifted the goalposts. This was a conversation on GB News discussing actor Benedict Cumberbatch's offer to take in refugees. Jim Davidson, what do you think about these celebrities who feel a need to politically virtue signal at these events? So you had Benedict Cumberbatch on the red carpet saying he hopes to take in a Ukrainian uh, refugee. I would say there's more chance of that happening than uh, his director, uh, Jane Campion, making a film that makes any sense. But, but yeah. what, what do you make of it when they take over these ceremonies to politically pontificate well it's, it's what people do it's their chance to get on the soapbox ask him if he'll take in a veteran that's homeless that's fought in many wars uh, for our country no that that's not that's not lefty enough 
So before it was, you can't support refugees unless you personally house them. And now it's, you can't support refugees unless you personally house them. And you also personally house veterans. Dalio, uh, how would you respond to Jim Davidson there? I mean, first of all, the production value of GP News, like where is the floor? Where, where is the floor? I cannot find it. Um, it just gets worse every time I see a clip from them. It just speaks to this really absurd and just flawed logic that lies at the heart of so much of this conservative approach to things like welfare and and um, and uh, migration, which is this flawed idea that, oh, we wish we could help everyone, but we just don't have enough stuff to help people with. We just don't have enough land. We don't have enough resources. The reason that, you know, we have ho um, homelessness on the streets is because just not enough people are willing to, you know, share their their accommodation, share their homes with homeless people. That's not why we have a homelessness problem. We have a homelessness problem because, well, a homelessness issue, because we have property is essentially in this country viewed as a, a notch on someone's investment portfolio rather than something that should be used to house people. It's because we have an entirely unaffordable housing crisis. We have a, a cost of living crisis now. It's because the way that our infrastructure is built, the way that our state orients itself, is not to is towards looking at these things, these essential human needs, like housing, like food, like ex all of these things, like even increasingly healthcare, as investment opportunities, as an asset class, rather than as something that should keep us all safe and give us all a basic standard of living. And the same goes for also this flawed idea that there's not enough room to take in displaced people when we know that vast swathes of the land in this country are being used for golf courses. We know that, you know, there is empty housing uh, all over the place. So it's this like false scarcity mentality that just, you know, penetrates a lot of this. And it's just, and the fact that they keep moving the goalposts in this way uh, just kind of shows how it's really based on a feeling that they just don't like seeing people help other people. That's basically the core of this politics. Kind of the core is that they don't like seeing people help other people. Because, you know, if you're, if you're signing up to have a refugee live in your house that's not virtue signaling that's you know that, that you're doing something very practical there and this is what i want to talk about in a bit more detail Dalia, because 120,000 people have signed up um to host a ukrainian refugee in their home you know unfortunately the government hasn't quite kept up with with this demand to help they've been incredibly slow at letting people in but do you think this you know this this outpouring of solidarity is something that can be generalized i mean you you compare this to sort of the syrian refugee crisis when i think britain let in only 20,000 people and then even then made it you know seem like a a disaster and oh this is a, a massive burden now ukrainian refugees have been presented very differently and all of a sudden there are 120,000 people who want to invite them in their own homes do you think that's you know because these are white european people or do you think that it's because of how the media have discussed this and if the media discussed other crises in a similar way then we could see a similar outpouring of of solidarity well, I think that the way that the media portray groups do, does help, does sort of structure the way that the general public responds to those people. And that's why the media has so much power. Unfortunately, I don't think we're going, we're seeing here a generalizable uh, shift in public opinion towards refugees, because I don't think that the previous narratives that we've spoken about, for example, with Syrian refugees, I don't think that was actually about refugees. Um, it wasn't about, we weren't having a conversation about people who had been displaced, about people who were fleeing for their lives. We were talking about the conversation that was happening was about black and brown people. It was about the humanity of black and brown people, not the humanity of just people who happen to be displaced. Um, and that sort of, it was drawing on an unnatural fear, which is racism, um, of not of displaced people, but of black and brown people. And so it was never that, it was never a genuine or inherent fear of the other. Uh, it was never a an idea that we didn't have enough resources to help people um, or that it was inherently unpopular amongst the public. 
it was very much, that narrative was rooted very much in here is a bunch of black and brown people. These are people that for decades and decades have been demonized and dehumanized relentlessly by political institutions, by the media, who we've been told are bringing all manner of terrible things from crime to terrorism, etc. That's obviously going to be internalized by the public. And that's not a, a specific refugee issue. It, it's, it's a race issue. Uh, race is the missing link as to why the government has been able to shift from, seem, seamlessly apparently, shift from the position that refugees are so dangerous that you can't even allow them into the country to refugees are so human that you should host them in your home. Obviously, our position is that that latter position should be generalized to all refugees. But because I don't feel like this moment, even though it is incredibly welcome and it's incredibly beautiful to watch, it's not addressing the racial element there because we still it still leaves intact the very racial exclusion and demonization that typically takes place for refugees who are typically from parts of the world that are on the brunt edge of colonialism, resource extraction, et cetera. Um, but the question of like, you know, what, what do we do there for? You know, what do we, that doesn't mean that we just give up and be, we just are pessimistic that things are never going to change for other kinds of refugees. What we need to do is you make sure that no one forgets this moment and that we draw strong parallels between how refugees have been received now, between what's possible um, in re when you have a refugee crisis and for future refugee crises. But also we need to lobby for more effective and humane systems for all refugees so that refugees to be implemented in this moment of public welcoming of refugees and like public understanding and empathy for what it means to be a refugee. That should be used now to implement long-term systems, long-term processes so that refugees of the future um, do not experience uh, the inhospitability, the cruelty, um, and the, the often poverty that refugees, particularly of the past decade um, in this country, have experienced. Let's wrap up there. Brilliant points to end the show with. Dahlia, thank you so much for joining me this evening. We'll be back on Friday at 7pm. You've been watching Tisky Sour on Navarra Media. Good night.